Good morning. Good morning. Glad to be here with everyone. For those who uh, made it out this morning, we commend you. The uh, snow and ice and cold weather has been a struggle for everyone, and hopefully as the days tick off, that will uh, come to an end and things will start to green up and we can see the ground and the sun and enjoy. It's been a while since I've had the opportunity to be up here and share what I like to think is <clears throat> some of my wisdom. Most of the time it's probably not. <clears throat> that some things can provoke thought in me like watching a movie or things I happen to see on a sign. Well this time it came from a uh, TV series that I was watching with my wife and no it wasn't a Hallmark movie. <clears throat> and one of the main one of the, the lines in the movie was the uh, cost of love is loss and that uh, evoked some thought for me and I began to think about loss and how we have a profound meaning for loss it's, it's, sometimes it might be easier for me to explain how much it hurts when I when I were to lose something then the, the other person that conversation could understand my meaning of loss now that type of loss might not be a situation where I heard a story once of a, a guy who was out fishing was hung his favorite fishing lure on the bottom of the river in February March and he didn't want to lose that lure so he waded out in his socks and underwear uh, chest deep water and, and got his lure. I don't think that's the loss they were talking about. It's a much, much deeper loss. And I can't tell you what that loss would be for me because your your list of loss may be different. So for the loss to be so profound and painful, the other side of that coin has to be love and the, the reward of love. And for us to follow God's word, which is in the Bible, the word love is in there, depending on which version you look at, 550 times, give or take. So to, to the Lord, love was profound and, and pure and special. So to offset the pain of loss, the reward of love has to be even more profound and, and far greater. And I think that the good Lord wanted us to live with that type of love for each other, for others, so if we are blessed to have the Lord in our lives and give us the strength and guidance to work towards that type of love, you join me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be in your house this morning and worship you. would ask that you be with those who are unable to be with us, those who are at home for an illness, those in the community who need our presence, our brothers and sisters who were affected by the snowstorm and cold weather. I'd ask you to be with us as we start this week and give us the strength and guidance in order to understand your meaning of love and how you want us to live our lives. And dear Lord, we love you with all of our heart. Amen. Amen. invite you to take the hymnals and turn to hymn number 72. We will glorify and then we'll go down and sing that bottom part and then flip over to number 80 and the title of that one is I Love You Lord. So we know both of those so uh, let's stand together and sing. We will glorify and I love you Lord. Oh, the rings in matches. 
number 66. May God be the Lord. of the Lord today. I missed all of you last week, uh, but thankfully uh, through the medium of technology, we were able to go ahead and have a virtual service together, but it really feels good when we can all come together and worship. Uh, the Bible teaches us that iron sharpens iron, and uh, that is better done when we are together. We welcome all of you that are joining us through Facebook this morning. God bless you. Uh, we certainly understand that uh, while main roads and the sun has helped a lot, there are still areas where it is still very slippery and snowy. And uh, we're glad that you were able to join us uh, through Facebook today. Uh, we're gonna dismiss our kids to Sunshine Kids this morning. And Miss Kelly will have something uh, especially for you back there today. And the rest of you are stuck with me. And uh, if you have your Bibles today, we're turning to the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, the very first chapter. Just in case there are technical difficulties this morning, I uh, saw where our friends across the street at the Methodist Church were 
having trouble being able to broadcast over Facebook uh, this morning, and so uh, hopefully we'll not have those problems. Um, and if we don't, we'll just we'll just uh, pack it up to God being nicer to people on this side of the street. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 14 I have seen all the works that are done under the sun and behold all is vanity and vexation of spirit another version the uh, new international version reads this way I have seen all the things that are done under the sun and all of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I want to minister to you for a few moments this morning on peace or constant chasing. It's our choice. Peace or constant chasing, it's our choice. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that it is light and life. Lord, as we come to this moment of ministry today, I pray that our hearts are open to receive. Let us hear today what the Spirit would say to us so that we may live our lives pleasing unto you. Father, we pray for all of your people wherever they are gathered today. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them that you would minister to them as they have need. Father, be with every minister today that will minister your word. I pray your anointing upon all of them, that the body of Christ might be uh, lifted up and challenged today. Lord, let us be mindful that we are to seek after you, to walk in your way. Lord, to glean those things that you have for us in Scripture that will help us to be more like you. Father, I pray that you would help me today to share those things that you have placed in my heart to share this morning. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Solomon, who is the author of our text this morning, is perhaps best known for his request for knowledge and wisdom upon becoming the king over Israel. And Ecclesiastes is a testament to this man who spent his life filling his heart and his mind with information. And his conclusion was that all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Seven times in the book of Ecclesiastes, he proclaims his investigation and study, and seven times he concludes that it is an endless parade of vanity and vexation of spirit. Now the Hebrew defines the word vanity as empty or without value, and vexation as a constant grasping or a constant chasing. So Solomon, a man of great power and wealth, takes note of all of his experiences in life and what he had witnessed in the life of others, and he declares it to be totally without value, and yet there is this constant chasing after more things that will never be satisfying. And with that in mind, I would suggest that the conclusions of Solomon 
paints a picture of someone that we must choose not to be. Now, we live in a world of many, many voices. Voices that often do not add anything of significance to us. There are certainly voices in our world that are inherently evil, and we can't overlook that. But mostly, we are confronted daily with voices that are simply filling spaces where something better, well, might be better. I am convinced that if we would take a moment at the end of each day to analyze the influences, the information, and the data, the voices, if you will, that fill our minds, the takeaway would be that they do little to nothing to improve who we are, that they do very little to challenge us to be better. Much of it would have no value at all. Which is probably why we are left always wanting more. Well, there is a better way. But it involves us being purposeful in choosing how we are going to spend our day. I have the power to choose what I read. I have the power to choose what I watch. I have the power of choosing what I think about. The power of choosing what voices I'm going to listen to. And those choices depend on what kind of life I want to experience. Do I want a life that is chaotic, confusing, and frustrating? Or do I want a life of peace in a world? that is chaotic, confusing, and frustrating. If you choose that you would rather have a life of peace, the Apostle Paul gives us a recipe for such a life. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 9, the Apostle says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. In verse 8, he says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Paul says three things here. Number one, don't worry about anything. Easier said than done. Number two, pray about everything. 
And number three, be thankful in all things. That is the basic ingredients in our daily spiritual recipe. Now, first of all, there is one ingredient that we do not want, and that is worry. Well, how do you keep from worrying? How do we remove worry from the equation of our life? Well, worry is removed by praying about all things that will concern us today. Those things that we know we will face and those things that we are not aware of that will crop up in the process of everyday life. Pray about those things. And then instead of dwelling on the things that we don't have or the things that we cannot control, we give God thanks for the blessings that we do have and we ask him for wisdom to deal with the things that we can control. When you do those things, Worry becomes less of an issue that we have to deal with. And that sets the baseline to which then we begin to add other ingredients. I want you to think about it in terms of making an apple pie. The only ingredients needed to make an apple pie is a pie crust and some apples. That's all you need. Now, my sister would say that, you know, in order to have a good crust, you would have to have, you know, some flour and some shortening or butter and baking soda and all those things that make good pie crust. But I got news for my sister. There's this department at Walmart in the frozen section. And there's these things called pet rits. And if you have a couple of pet rits and some apples, you can make you an apple pie. That's all you need. But I need to tell you that there are some other ingredients that will make eating that apple pie a lot more pleasant. Some sugar and some cinnamon and some butter goes a long way in making a blue ribbon worthy apple pie. And if you add a big scoop of vanilla ice cream, it just adds another layer to that enjoyment. Well, life is like that. We have a base recipe. And when we get that base recipe set with prayer and thanksgiving, then we can begin to add things that will make life much more content and much more satisfying. And Paul tells us how to do that. We start by adding things that are honest and just. Now we live in an age when there's a lot of misinformation out there. And misinformation causes us to gravitate toward wherever our biases are. We begin to seek out news that fits the narrative that we want to believe. 
doesn't matter really whether there's any truth to it or not. It's what we want to hear. And so we feed ourselves with that. And we shut ourselves off to any other uh, variables to that. That's a dangerous thing to do. Paul says, look for those things that are honest. Look for those things that are just. A lot of times I don't try to find something that fits with my belief. I try to find the opposing view. I try to see the other side of it and then try to put that all together to come up with really what's true here. Sometimes that's the only way that we can get to the honest answer. Everybody has the narrative that they want to put out there. What we feed on is what we will become in our own thought processes. So we start by adding things that are honest and just. And then we seek out those ingredients that are pure, that are lovely, that are praiseworthy. We begin by looking for examples of Christian love and service. The other day we received a telephone call from one of our local businesses. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't divulged who that is because I don't think they wanted any notoriety. But they called and said, if we can help in any way, if we can get someone to a doctor's appointment, if we can get someone to the grocery store, if anybody needs any kind of transportation or needs anything brought to them, Here's our numbers. They gave me their business number and a cell number. And they said, we want to help. I thought that was pretty praiseworthy. I thought that showed Christian love and concern for our community during all of this snow and ice that we had to contend with over the last few days. Begin to meditate on reports of the church being the hands and feet of Jesus. Thursday and Friday, Coach Forshee, who is the 7th and 8th grade uh, coach, uh, basketball coach at West Plains. He is also the youth minister at the Assembly of God Church in Pomona. And he has a youth ministry called TAP, T-A-P. And he got uh, a bunch of guys from his youth ministry. And Thursday and Friday, they uh, cleared the drives and walkways of 22 homes and also of uh, the senior center. And uh, they did all of that uh, without any uh, pay, without any uh, contributions of any kind. That was just something that he wanted to teach to his youth group that we're here to serve, we're here to, to help. And, and so they sought out homes where uh, uh, the people perhaps were uh, elderly or disabled and uh, could not uh, do it themselves and, and maybe didn't have the money to hire it done. And so they went out and, and they began to do those things. And it was a great blessing to our community. And so there are reports out there like that. First Baptist Church opened up one of their buildings for a warming center for the homeless. There are acts of kindness 
that are all around us. But often it gets obscured or it gets overlooked or it gets overshadowed by all of these other voices that are vying for our attention. Paul says, think on these things. Meditate on these things. It seems too simple, doesn't it? But here we have the ingredients to a mind and a heart that makes an earthly house a place where the God of peace can find a home. And when the God of peace enters into our life and into our, our, the very essence of our being, that it's not just something that we sort of see in the abstract. But to know that he is involved in every aspect of our life. He brings with that an understanding of peace because we know that he is with us. Now I, I know it's sometimes difficult because of all of the things that we go through in life. And sometimes we're wondering, Lord, why this storm? Can I just tell us today that God never builds a storm that he's not in? And that storm may be too big for me, but it's not too big for him. And the reason for the storm is so that I will learn to trust him. And when I learn to trust him, that he is in this storm, that he is in this trial, that he is in this time of challenge, then I have peace. Not because everything around me is okay, but because who is with me makes it okay. Paul even concludes by adding a little practical advice. He says, I want you to do this. I want you to remember the things that you were taught. I, I want you to remember the things that you heard from me. But not only that you heard, but that you saw me live out in front of you. Paul was not just a preacher. He was a practicer, if that's a word. He practiced what he preached. He did what he told others to do. And it's not enough. It's not enough for any church to just hear the word from a preacher. But to see that word lived out in front of them. I don't want to just get up here and tell you that it's a utopian place that you can be in Christ. But I do want to be able to tell you that there is a peace that goes beyond our human understanding. When we put our lives in the hands of Jesus Christ and choose to stay there, knowing that everything he does, he does for our good, to bring us closer in relationship to him. It's not his will that we perish. Now we can apply that to sinners. That it's not the Lord's will that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. It's God's will. It's God's hope. It's God's desire that everybody would come to a relationship with him. But after doing that, after we commit our lives to Christ, 
After we make him the Lord and master of our lives, it's not his will that we perish. And so things do not happen to us because he's angry. Things do not happen to us because he, he wants to play around with our minds and our emotions. Things happen because that's life. And whether you're a Christian or whether you're not, we all have to deal with the experiences of life. It's not just the ungodly that get sick. It's not just the ungodly that go through financial trials. It's not just the ungodly that have bad things happen to them. The Bible says that it rains on the just and the unjust. And so even though we're doing our best to live for God, to obey the word of God, there are going to be times in our life when we're going to come up against a roadblock. Jesus, after teaching the crowds, said to his disciples, I want you to get in the boat and go the other side and I'll meet you there. So they got in the boat and they took off on their journey. And guess what happened? Storm came up. Why was there a storm? Who built the storm? The Lord built the storm. Why did he build the storm? Because he wanted his disciples to see that I am in the storm with you. And so while they're in fear for their lives, Jesus comes walking on the water. At first, they thought it was a ghost, and Jesus said, it's, it's I, be not afraid. And as he entered into the boat, he spoke to those winds, and he spoke to the waves, and he said, peace be still. And the elements obeyed him. Why? Because Jesus didn't want his disciples to perish. That wasn't his purpose. The purpose was to bring them closer to him, to show them that in the most challenging times of life that you can have peace because the Lord is with you. A life of peace is attainable. God would not have offered us a life of peace if it wasn't within reach. But we have to choose. We have to choose. What are we going to listen to that is going to bring chaos and confusion and frustration Or what are we going to think of that brings us peace and serenity? The choice is up to you and me. And anything outside of Jesus Christ and his word is going to be a constant chasing, a constant grasping, for something that I can hold on to that will give me a moment's peace. What the world offers is fleeting. What the world offers is without value. It's worthless. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I, will give you rest. I will give you peace. I will comfort you. I will be your security blanket. I would invite you to join with me today in choosing wisely. Choose to listen to those voices that encourage us to be better. That challenges us to be reflections of Christ. 
Listen to those voices that build up the body of Christ. Listen to those reports that tug at our heartstrings, that brings our emotions to the surface, that causes a tear in the eye, a lump in the throat. As we see the hands of Jesus at work through his church. And these churches aren't doing what they do for bragging rights. We do it because it's the thing to do. Because not only do we want the peace that passes all understanding, but we also know that we live in a world where a lot of people are not at peace. They're struggling. They're hurting. They're crying. They're searching. They're seeking. The other day I put on Facebook, that someone needed to see Jesus today. And I just simply said, be Jesus. You see your neighbor? He may be or she may be needing to see Jesus. Not likely that the Lord is going to leave heaven and knock on that door. If Jesus shows up, it's probably going to be because someone in the body of Christ knocked on the door. If you want to see Jesus in your life, look at your own hands. Let's look at our own abilities. What are we doing? And will we be able to say as Paul did, don't just listen to me. But look at how I lived it out in front of you and then go and do the same. And when we do that, not only will we know the peace of God that passes all understanding, but we'll be able to share it with others as we become the reflection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you today for letting us know again just a simple reminder of the peace that is available in you. Lord, we seek after many things. We chase after careers. We chase after security. And we do all of those things, trying to be a good citizen, trying to be a good provider. None of those things are wrong. Matter of fact, it's our responsibility. But that can't be our end goal, not for peace. Because if it is, we'll find that no matter how much we acquire, it'll never be enough. No matter how much power we get, it'll never be enough. Lord, let our in game be in you to seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness and you said that you will add all these other things to it and so Lord today help us to put our priorities where they need to be Lord to grasp for those things that are lasting to cling to those things that are true. And Lord, to trust in the only one who is trustworthy. And that is you. So that we might live a life of peace in the midst of chaos. Let our life be content. Let our minds be at rest because we know we're in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we come to the table of the Lord in communion today,
I would just like to simply state that the peace that is offered to us can be found because of what these elements represent. Jesus did not only die for our sin. Even though that is the main uh, focus when we talk about the Lord's sacrifice was for redemption, we know that man alone is not worth much. We needed a redeemer. And Jesus became that spotless lamb and died for the sin of the world. But he didn't die just for that. It wasn't just so we could be saved. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have that more abundantly. Other places in Scripture, the Bible talks about how the Lord delights to give good gifts. And we have been blessed. I have been blessed. I've been blessed to be able to go places I never thought I'd go, do things I never thought I'd be able to do, have things that I never thought I could afford to have. God's been good to me. I think I have a pretty abundant life. But what I'm thankful for is I'm thankful for the peace that I have in my spirit. We're hopefully on the backside of the pandemic vaccine that people are are taking and it's bringing some uh, peace of mind and things are beginning to open back up more and more. And I'm thankful today that I can honestly say that throughout this whole pandemic, there's been a peace in my spirit. Yeah, we've had, we've had obstacles that we've had to overcome. We've been inconvenienced. Haven't been able to do a lot of things that we would have normally done. Last summer, vacation got canceled. And uh, in the place of that, though, my wife got a new deck on the back of the house. And... Uh, so, you know, we didn't get to do everything that we would have probably done in a summer, but there was peace. I began to spend less time listening to the news. I began to put my focus elsewhere. Not, not, to, not, not to dismiss or not to ignore but it just seemed wherever you turned, it was a different story. It was a different message, a different narrative. And so I just chose that I was just going to do the things that I could do. And those things were simple. Do I like wearing a mask? No, I don't. But it was something I could do. Do I like social distancing? Those that know me know I don't like the social distance. But it was something I could do. Could we mark off pews and still have church? Yeah, we did that for a while. It was something we could do. But there were things I couldn't do. There were things I had no control over and I could have worried about that. But instead, I just put that in the hands of God. And I made a deal with him. I said, Lord, I'll do what I can do and you do what you can do. 
And in the end, hopefully it'll all be okay. It's not been the easiest thing to try to pastor a church in the midst of a pandemic. I'm not in that boat by myself. The elders are in it with me. Every church in West Plains are in that same predicament. We just had to try to find our way. We had to try to just lean on the Lord. But you know what? Over the last year, we have not had any elders meetings where we came in wringing our hands and just wondering what in the world are we going to do? Every step of the way, the Lord has been with us. We've been at peace with the decisions that we've had to make. And I am looking forward. I, I believe uh, that within the next few weeks, next couple of months, I believe things are going to be able to be opened back up. I'm looking forward to getting back to Wednesday night uh, time together when we study the Word of God and fellowship with one another. I'm really looking forward to a fellowship meal. And hopefully somebody will bring an apple pie that's not just a crust and, and apples. <laughs> but all of that is because of this. All of that peace and all of that contentment is because Jesus said, I love you. I love you. And Darren, God's love has been greater than our loss. The things that we had to sacrifice and do without, God's love has never wavered. Not once. And today we honor him. And today we say thank you. Through this wafer and through this little cup of juice, that represents the love that Jesus has for us. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And likewise, he took the cup. He blessed it said, drink ye all of it. This is my blood shed for you. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your presence. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of life that is made available because of your death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, it's not always easy. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes life takes its toll. Lord, thank you today for your promise to never leave us or forsake us. Thank you that you work all things together for our good. Thank you today, Lord, for the promise of your return. As we are around your table now in communion, we hold on to that promise. And Lord, we'll continue to honor you until that day arrives. We will continue to thank you and show our appreciation for your sacrifice so that we might have life. Not only abundant life here on earth, but eternal life with you. Father, we just give you thanks today. We honor you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Larry's going to come and lead us in our closing hymn today. And so why don't we all join together? Let's all stand together and 
help Larry see. Turn to him number 343, no, no, 344. He's got the whole world in his hands. sang that song and that would have been our message. <laughs> because if he's got it all in his hands, can we have anything other than peace? Amen. God bless you. Uh, I hope that you have a week that is blessed of the Lord. Um, and I, I preach this today fully aware that some in our congregation are facing very steep hills to climb. And I don't in any way um, try to minimize that, try to overlook that, but just to encourage you that in those moments, in those situations, God is with us. Not only is God with you, but your church family is with you. I don't say it enough, but I appreciate so much being able to send out a prayer request and know that that request is going to be prayed over. The way that you care for one another is exemplary. And I praise you for that. And in that, I find peace to know that not only do I have this truth that the Lord is with me, but to know if you need me or if I need you, we're going to be there. And we're going to be Jesus to one another. And we'll continue to be Jesus to our community. And by doing so, the Lord will be lifted up and he will be glorified. So I love you. I'm praying for you. And as always, I'm just a phone call away. If there's anything I can do, and if I can't do it, I know we have people in our congregation that are willing to always help. And for that, I am very, very thankful. So First Christian Church, thank you for being the people of God. Thank you for having a heart of concern and compassion and willingness to help others. And I pray God smiles upon every one of you this week. God bless you. As we're dismissed, let us pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you.